Okay. So for the purpose of um, recording, I will tell you that I am Fran Bagnall from the University of Colorado. And um, I came over to the US to uh, get some planetary experience. And I got involved in Voyager and uh, studying magnetic fields and plasmas at the giant planet Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and um, have branched out to look at the sun a bit, look at Pluto a bit. So I sort of span the whole solar system. Missing, well, that's not quite true. I was going to say missing the Earth, but I did my very first paper was on the Earth. OK, so let's talk about planetary magnetic fields. And uh, wake up question, uh, which planets do not currently have active dynamos? Which, which ones? Mercury doesn't have an active dynamo? Where have you been? Oh, yes, it does. Mars doesn't. Pluto doesn't. Which else? Venus. Huh? Sister planet, same size. What? Oh, yes, it is, mate. Where the heck are you being? Who are you, astrophysicist? It's all your fault. Ooh, keep your mouth shut, mate. You're in trouble. OK. We've talked a lot about this. We don't need to go. OK, so the question is, it's not obvious that size is not the only criterion, right? And that we've got Earth and Venus, which is a big puzzle. Why is Mercury got a magnetic field, so on and so forth? We'll talk a bit about this. So let's go through these magnetic fields of the planets Earth, Saturn, Jupiter, uh, Uranus, and Neptune. I don't have um, Ganymede and Mercury in this particular slide, but we'll come back to those. Um, but what I've put here is to think about if you had a tilted, with respect to the spin axis, magnetic field, and you describe the magnetic field as a tilt and an offset, you will see, and where is our pointer? Anybody got a pointer? We seem to be short of pointers. You'll get one, OK. Um, you'll see that there are a huge range. So obliquity, what does obliquity mean? Tilt of the spin axis with respect to the ecliptic plane, or orbital plane, thank you. Uh, and tilt is the tilt of the dipole. So you can see that the Earth, we know our familiar uh, situation where we have a 23 and a half degree obliquity with respect to the um, ecliptic plane. Uh, and then we have something like 11 degrees um, uh, uh, tilt of the dipole with respect to the spin axis. And you'll also notice the directions that the Earth has the uh, field coming out of the South Pole into the North, and Jupiter has it coming out of the North Pole going into the South. You have to keep remembering that sign flip um, when, we, when we go from planet to planet. OK. Uh, and then also note that uh, we have the tilt of the magnetic field with respect to the spin axis is you know about 10 degrees, about 10 degrees. And then we have zero for Saturn, which is a big mystery. And I think Nick will talk a little bit about this uh, um, later. And then we have Uranus and Neptune with these huge tilts, 59 degrees and 47 degrees with respect to this, uh, the magnetic axis to the spin axis, um, and a huge offset. And really, all that means is this approximation offset and tilted dipole approximation is uh, not a good one. So I have a couple of questions. Which planet has the least seasonal effect? And which one has the strongest seasonal effect of these here? Which has the weakest seasonal effect? Is summer school's about season? Why Jupiter? Because what? The obliquity is very small. Somebody said Saturn. Why did you say Saturn? Right, OK. When we talk about a seasonal effect, we're talking about changes over the orbital period. right? And so you can see that just as with Earth, if you've got a, a tilt 
of the obliquity of the spin axis, as it goes around the sun, you're going to have a big change in, in there are going to be times when you have a solstice with the pole pointed towards the sun or away from the sun. You're going to have an equinox when you're side on to the sun. And so the seasonal effect on Saturn is actually going to be very similar to the seasonal effect on the Earth. And the planet with the least seasonal effect will, of course, be Jupiter because as it goes around the sun, um, that will be the orientation will be the same. Um, true, you've got a wobble, the 10 degree wobble of the magnetic field due to that tilt of the magnetic axis, but the seasonal effect will be the least on Jupiter. OK, so now it's an easy question to answer. Which of these planets will have the largest seasonal effect? It's going to be one of the biggest obliquity, which of course is Uranus, right? And this is a really interesting problem about how the magnetosphere goes through radical changes in its configuration over the orbit, um, and something that is really asking to be explored with a, a, a mission, right? So mission to Uranus is, would be really cool and interesting. I'm really pushing for that. It would be fun um, and, and to understand that. And we'll talk a bit about how um, this is useful the relevance to Earth is that as the Earth goes through reversals, maybe we're seeing configurations that may be more similar to Uranus and Neptune. So there is a practical application that's not purely um, theoretical. So if we look at the surface magnetic fields of these planets, you will see this, these are normalized um, values. But you can see for a tilted dipole, for a non-tilted dipole, you see a very symmetric field here. Uh, and then for a tilted dipole like Earth and Jupiter, you see very similar sort of structures um, with, the, with the polarity reversed. And then Uranus and Neptune, you see very non-dipolar magnetic fields. OK. So how do we describe magnetic fields? You've seen something like this before from Janet. Um, what we tend to do is to take a, a, an expansion of a, a potential and, and describe it in terms of functions. These are the um, Legendre polynomials illustrated here, these cool little movies uh, that, that, that are here. And then coefficients that you multiply in front, which tells you how much of each of these functions you're going to use. Now, be warned, as, as Janet pointed out, there are different normalizations that are used. So there's often a, a number in front that will, will depend on the index here. Um, but the principle is the same and is applied throughout uh, geophysics and astrophysics in many different ways. Let me just show you two examples. Here's the cosmic microwave background. People use spherical harmonics to describe that. You can see then of a lot of complexity in that, a little at the low order scale. Uh, and then the interior of the sun for seismology. The same sort of mathematical process is used. Now for the Earth, um, let me show you the International Geomagnetic Reference Field. You can go and get this online. Uh, and what's interesting is you don't expect to read these numbers, of course. These columns, um, these are the coefficients going down here. These are years, so the values for different years, starting at 1900 and going all the way. This is to uh, 2010 over here, right? So you can see the variation in these coefficients with time. And this is actually pages long, right? This is four pages long and goes all the way up to the 13th component in each direction, right? So our knowledge of the Earth is extraordinary. Now, I'm not sure I believe all of these numbers at high, high values. Um, and they've only been known for the last few years. Um, but uh, this is a way in which the Earth's magnetic field is described in gory, gory detail. And I'll show you what, how much well we know this for other planets. So of course, when we describe the magnetic field, we ha uh, use uh, various terms. Declination is the angle from pointing to um, the North Pole. That's the, the amount the compass is varied east-west. Inclination is the inclination uh, up-down, the tilt of the um, the magnetic axis, and you can see this is pretty uniform except for a region around the South Atlantic. Again, you can also see the South Atlantic effect here. And then the total intensity 
um, you can see, uh, again, has this, you know, the South Atlantic anomaly seems to just really stick out, which is kind of um, interesting. We'll talk about this when we get to other planets. So what you can do is, uh, if you want to try and understand uh, how the magnetic field has varied with time, you can look at the surface variations. Um, but it's probably more useful, if you're interested in the dynamo, to extrapolate downwards. And to, so you take the radial uh, surface field, and uh, you, you extrapolate down to the core mantle boundary, where you'll see it's much more complex. And then you can also use this uh, formulation to relate the rate of change in time with the uh, flows uh, on the, at the core mantle boundary. Now, one point that you will see again and again in the next couple of days is the fact that the, when you get down into the dynamo region, the field is a lot more complex. And Carl actually was telling me this morning that if you think about it, this is much more like the complexity of the field of the, you're seeing in the sun, because you're seeing the core mantle boundary right up at the surface of the sun. OK. So. Um, Let's think about how the Earth's magnetic field has varied over time. And I just pulled this up off the web, like Jan. You know, there's nothing like Google to find your, find your graphics. This is the Southern Hemisphere, and this is the Northern Hemisphere. And you'll see that since 1900, the magnetic pole has moved away from the South Pole and moved towards the North Pole. And it's actually moving quite quickly uh, across um, the North Pole. Um, and then it says here, geomagnetic pole and magnetic pole. What is the difference between these two kinds of poles? What are we talking about? How can the Earth have different magnetic poles? What are we talking about? What? What? What's going on here? These are two terms that are used to describe two different things. What are the? Yeah? Wait. Okay, you get you're getting in the right you're getting in the right direction. So you're thinking a bit the right way. So you've got magnetic pole here. We've got geomagnetic pole here. Notice that the geomagnetic pole varies less, and in this case, it's moving towards the pole. In this case, it's moving towards the pole. So they're moving in the same way by the same amount. These are little hints I'm giving you. You're saying. One thing is you can take a compass, and you can look at the compass, or a very sophisticated magnetometer, same thing, and you'll see a signature. If you were looking for using a compass, a magnetic pole, what would you look for with the compass? You've got a compass. You're walking around, and you're looking for the North Pole. How would you define a North magnetic pole you know, you're all cold in the Arctic, and you're wandering around. You're some ancient dressed up in seal skins, and you're carrying your compass. What are you looking for? Yeah. What? Yeah. So if it's no horizontal, where's the field going? Down, right? You're looking for a radial field where all of the horizontal ones are pointing into the same place, right? So the, the magnetic pole is, in fact, that pole, okay, where you find that physically on the surface all the field is radial. So what do you think the geomagnetic pole is? Thinking back to what we were doing dipole. earlier, dipole. Making a dipole approximation, where is the dipole? Okay, And you can see that this, all of this wandering of the poles is associated, really, with the complexity of the high order moments uh, when, in fact, the geomagnetic pole has not wandered a whole uh, hasn't wandered very much. Okay, so that's just uh, another way of thinking about the difference between um, these two kinds of poles. Uh, in reality, when you use modeling, you're going to probably use a, a dipole, right? And that's the one you're going to be thinking about. But also recognize that the non-dipolar components of the field can have an effect on um, where the actual real pole is. And this is going to affect if you're doing modeling 
of uh, radiation belts or modeling of phenomena in, in these regions. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. Not only was it 1900, but do you know who first, the first person to, to use the word magnetism and magnetic pole and, and all these sort of things? So we're thinking about dipoles and they did all this. Do you know how far back it goes? Queen Elizabeth's reign, the doctor, medical doctor of Queen Elizabeth, whose name um, has escaped me for a second. Gilbert. Gilbert, thank you. Um, he uh, picked up a piece of magnetic rock and, and uh, realized that there was a dipole and said, hey, well, maybe the Earth has the same sort of thing. So the sailors were all going around with their compasses and measuring it and mapping it out. Oh, yeah. They'd been measuring the dipole component of the Earth's magnetic, not the magnitude, but the direction and the structures since the 1600s. So, yeah, yep, known pretty well. So this uh, concept has been explored for many decades. Yeah. OK. Uh, secular variation. So if you then go back and look at how things have changed over time, this is 1880. You know, of course, in the early days, they didn't have very good global coverage, but by the 18, late 1880s, you know, it was global. And so then you compare it with 1980, uh, a century later, this is the sort of change. You know, some subtleties in the change. And then if you look at uh, the rate of change, you can see uh, it's very spotty over the surface, right? So these are the sort of fluctuations and changes in the um, morphology of the field. OK, so this is a movie, and I apologize. I do not remember the source. It came from a previous summer school, and I don't know who gave me this movie. But it's a movie of BR through a reversal. And um, what you're seeing is changes in strength um, uh, and, and a flip. So let's go back. We'll go back to the beginning in a minute when it gets through the end. But um, which will be, yeah. So at the end, you've got, uh, the, sorry, at the beginning, you've got blue here and orangey red up there. The dipole weakens. You get the higher order multipoles. The field is a little weaker, but doesn't go away. And then you end up with the opposite, with red at the bottom and blue at the top, the end of the reverse. OK. So let's talk again a little bit about reversals. These are derived by looking at the magnetization of rocks. Very useful is to go look at the middle, and this is where plate tectonics was sort of originally explored. The origin, origins, the center of, say, the Atlantic Ridge, with the spreading of the continents away, producing, exposing uh, magnetic rock, and they noticed that they were flipped in direction, and then went and looked at these and, and, and measured the age. You can then get a flipping of the field as a function of time. Uh, in millions of years. And so uh, this is zero. This is now going back in time. There were times when there seemed to be a, a more steady field, or that's what the observations are showing. There's the areas of lack of data here. But as you go back in time, there seems to be a change in the rate of reversals too, not just the, the sign, but also the rate of reversals. And so you can see the Earth's dynamo does not have a simple uh, 10, 10 and a half year, 11 year cycle, like the, like the solar cycle, um, it's erratic. Um, and uh, I think technically it's chaotic. So my question for you is currently, what is the typical time between reversals? If you look at this plot and tell me what the typical time is between a reversal. Reversal rate, so this is now, so this is four per million years, so one is 250,000 years between, which is quite a long time, thank goodness, <laughs> uh, but of course this is varied a lot with time. Okay. So let's look at other magnetic fields. We can, we've used this technique of crustal magnetization. It's only the upper layers of the crust that have this remnant magnetization. 
why why is it not uh, why does it only have the crust and not retain deeper down inside why is this only a crustal magnetization yeah so we get mixed up that's yes that's partly part that's that's one good answer there's another reason why the magnetization is only observed at the surface and if you went deeper you would not see it right so it's you the 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 um the freezing out for want of a better the, there's a probably a more technical term for freezing out because it's not it happens uh, the, the, the crustal magnetization, the orientation with respect to freezing in the local field requires the rock to be cold. And once it gets warm, you go above the Curie temperature, you no longer uh, freeze out the, you, you won't be freezing the local magnetic field. Um, you won't be orienting the crystals in a certain way, right? So for the moon, we have a crustal magnetization, uh, which is quite weak. Here we have Okay, so let me, we're going to see a few of these. You have power in this vertical axis, many orders of magnitude, and then you have degree of complexity. So that's those spherical harmonics, those higher spherical harmonics. And you'll see for the moon, it's pretty weak, right? And uh, a weak magnetization. Um, that there's some debate about its origin, um, about how, whether or not the, the moon actually ever had a, a dynamo to speak of. Um, but the only evidence thereof is magnetic fields are in the surface. Uh, similarly with Mars, has much stronger, in fact, the crustal magnetization of Mars is much stronger than that of the, of the Earth. And this is probably because there's a much thicker layer of crust in which you can have that magnetization, as well as perhaps the rocks are more uh, um, maintain and hold that magnetization uh, better than, than the rocks of the Earth. Uh, but you can see that for the Earth, you have a core field that is associated with a dynamo, drops off steeply um, at, with complexity, and then flattens out once you get into the crustal mag 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 magnetic field. So the question is, did, did the moon ever have a dynamo? And uh, why did Mars's dynamo appear to die out about three and a half billion years ago? Okay, long time ago. So it really was not around for very long, maybe only a billion years. Okay, so here's Mars. The consequence of the uh, crustal magnetic field that are quite strong is that it influences and affects the solar wind interaction with the ionosphere and outer layers of this planet. Um, but there isn't, you'll see, the standoff distance or where the bow shock is uh, upstream is really quite close to the planet. This is a really small interaction with the ionosphere rather th than the magnetic field. Okay, so. Trivia question for you. Which spacecraft is currently exploring this environment? Maven, right. Local. Have to plug for our local, local mission. OK. So let's talk about, you're going to hear a lot more about uh, dynamos from Gary Glatzmeyer. Um, my very simple uh, uh, description is that you need to have, uh, you need to have three things. You need to have a, uh, you need to have some rotation, and every planet, every object in the solar system actually has enough rotation, so that's not really such a big deal. Uh, but the important things are a volume of conducting fluid, and you need to, it needs to be convecting. And the consequences of putting those two together, Gary will talk about later this morning. What I want to talk about is to look at the different planetary objects and think about those two criteria. A, a conducting region, a fluid region, and the fact that it has to have energy that is driving um, the convection that's inside. Um, so when we look at these uh, terrestrial objects, and I'll include some moons over here, you'll see that there is uh, uh, a dynamo at Mercury, Earth, and Ganymede, but not at Venus, Moon, and Mars though they could have been in the past. I think this yes is a get rid of this question mark. I mean, we know that, that Mercury has dynamo. The que there are questions about why it is um, a, such a weak field that it is. And then look at the size of the core. You'll see 
Mercury has a very large core. You can see here, it has a very large core. Uh, Venus and Earth are similar in size, cores about half the size of the planet. Uh, the Moon, it's really small. Mars is comparable to um, Mercury and Venus in relative size, but of course the planet is uh, a lot smaller overall. And then Ganymede, you know, why, why has this Moon got a, got a magnetic field? So um, the, there are big questions about how to drive the dynamos. Yep. Yes. Uh, it's a it's a, th a three to five resonance, I think, with the sun. So it's not. Ooh, ooh, asymmetry of Mercury's core. Do you know what that is, Gary? Is that significant? Yeah, like is it is it um, is it oblate or shifted? I think that the dynamo is shifted. It's clear that there is a stronger. It's hemispherically shifted. I think northward. But is that due to the dynamo having an asymmetry or the actual core? I, I'm sure Mercury. I mean, Messenger has has described that, uh, but I I thought it was I wasn't aware that it has an asymmetry. Yeah, inside. So you think the tidal, you think the tidal, there is a tidal shaping of the core. Three to, I thought it was a three to five. This can be checked on Google. Okay, never mind. Okay, so yeah, so so in fact, tidal, tidal forcing from the sun could be a source of energy, could be a source certainly of complexity in terms of controlling the shape. Good question. Excellent. Thinking like a geophysicist. Right. OK. Uh, but then comes the question, why don't Venus and Mars have dynamos? OK. So let's think about the Earth. And uh, I, this is something that I learned from coming to these summer schools, um, where we had some discussions with the Earth's dynamo. And um, I've always um, been thinking about the fact, when we look at the Earth's core, we have an inner core, which is uh, solid iron, with a fairly small percentage of lighter elements. A little bit of sulfur, a little bit of other um, uh, metals. And then the outer core, which is liquid, has about 10% of a lighter element. And we know this for the Earth because we do all this detailed geophysical experiments of sounding of the interior using seismic signals, using electromagnetic signals, and so on. So we learn and understand what the interior is like of the Earth in gory, gory detail, which we don't have for the other planets. But what we uh, know is that as the uh, iron settles down and, and, and freezes out, so solidifies near the surface, you will be heavier material will be sinking down. Lighter material is being raised up, if you like. So you're releasing gravitational potential energy, which can drive a convection inside. But what's interesting is that you, you, you have about three to five terawatts of power then um, being released through the core mantle boundary up into the mantle. And it, that's going to be driving some um, convective flow in the mantle. But what's interesting is you then look at the amount of energy that is being released out through the surface because of plate tectonics driving upper mantle convection, moving the crusts around, you have this huge cooling at the top. So then you have to say, look, yes, you've got something driving convection inside, but you've also got this huge cooling up the top at the top. And so this is an important component that you have to think about when you um, uh, are running your dynamo, and Gary will talk more about this, uh, how do you model what's driving the convection? You have to also think about not only the heat flow from below, but also the cooling uh, from above. So we have to, to uh, consider this. Now, of course, this may be the clue about why Venus uh, and, and Mars, to some extent, don't have dynamos. 
Uh, rotation's not the issue. You'll often read in textbooks written by astrophysicists, another sling at those nasty astrophysicists, um, <laughs> uh, that there's not enough rotation in Venus. Uh, there's enough rotation, uh, and if David Stevenson says it's so, then it must be so. You'll hear more about him in a minute. Um, the real issue is the lack of, uh, and they also have conducting fluid in the core, as far as we know, with the limited geophysical uh, experience that we have of, of Venus and, the, uh, and uh, Mars. Uh, but what's probably happening is if you don't have plate tectonics, which neither Venus nor uh, Mars have right now, then you're not cooling the upper layers. Of course, Venus also has this huge greenhouse effect heating and maintaining a high temperature on the surface, then you have a very low temperature gradient at Venus, and um, Mars has sort of basically cooled off and um, the, the, uh, the interior. And so there's no interior driving things, no he interior heat driving things on, on Mars anymore. Uh, but on Venus, um, the convection seems to have, have slowed down and stopped. Now, if you look at Venus, you will know that 600 million years ago, there was a complete resurfacing of Venus. So there, are, there has been geological activity, and there may be very low-level geological activity now. And the question is, what happened before that period? We don't know, because it was completely resurfaced. Uh, but it's entirely possible that it had an active dynamo. It had, had much more terrestrial behavior. Um, but at some point, its ge geology changed. So maybe that Venus is more episodic rather than the steady uh, uh, geological processes on the surface. So this is a really important, interesting problem for um, uh, geophysics and planetary science in comparing Earth and Venus that involves everything from um, dynamo theory to interior structure to formation to geological processes to uh, atmospheric processes. Right. So. Um, again, another cross-disciplinary study comparing our sister Earth and, uh, and Venus, our near, nearby planet. Okay, so just to return to Mercury and Venus superficially, um, we, we have some sense of what their interiors are like from gravitation or perturbations of spacecraft moving close by, uh, measuring. You remember the GRACE satellite that Jan mentioned um, for the Earth, measuring the gravity of the Earth by having two spacecraft going over the Earth, communicating with each other. And the differential gravity on the two spacecraft gives us some sense of the, uh, the high level perturbations in the magnetic, uh, sorry, of the gravitational field underneath the spacecraft to give us the uh, distribution of mass underneath the spacecraft. We do the same thing with messenger flying over and with Galileo flying past Ganymede, we get a sense of the interior. But our knowledge is, is limited with these, just these simple gravity measurements. Um, and there are, there's Messenger that has more detailed understanding. And I don't have a current, um, uh, don't, don't, I'm not current with knowing exactly what the structure is inside, our best knowledge of that. Uh, and JUICE will be going to go into orbit eventually around Ganymede and exploring that, that world. So um, we don't really know what's going on inside of these objects. Um, but as David Stevenson says, the test of a good theorist is the ability to explain any outcome, even when the data are wrong. <laughs> and uh, I'll leave with you with that useful quote. <laughs> So let's move on to Jupiter and Saturn, Uranus and Neptune in a bit. These are gas giants, mostly hydrogen. How come they have dynamos inside? These are gas giants. They're gases. It's hydrogen. Hydrogen's not conducting. How come they have magnetic fields? What's going on? Metals in their core. This is the core, piddly. True, it's actually bigger than the Earth, but maybe 15 <laughs> times the size of the Earth. But compared with the size of the planet, mm, gases are ionized, maybe. Yeah? Metallic hydrogen, yes. 
metallic hydrogen. So how come hydrogen becomes metallic? How does hydrogen become metallic? Pressure. Right. So we have, in the interior of these gas giants, we have hydrogen that at the surface has uh, a, a molecular state. Uh, but then once you move to about 1.5 megabars, million bars, million times the pressure in this atmosphere, then you end up with um, a plasma state where you break apart um, the ions and the electrons uh, to make this. So that if the ions and the electrons can move separately, you've got a conducting medium, and so this is metallic hydrogen. And this has been um, explored somewhat in the lab, but also using quantum mechanical models of how um, hydrogen responds to pressure and temperature. Okay, uh, I'm not going to do it now, but in, normally when I give this to a class of undergraduates, I do the um, interpretive dance of the pressure at the center of Jupiter. If you want that, you'll have to ask for that later. Okay, so what about Saturn? Saturn has a weaker uh, magnetic field. Uh, it's about a third the mass of Jupiter, so it has much less um, hydrogen, and so you have to go deeper to get to this uh, 2.5 megabar phase transition, and so a much smaller volume uh, is in fact conducting, and so it has a much weaker magnetic field. Uranus and Neptune uh, ha have even less mass, and so we have a problem here that hydrogen never gets to um, this, this phase transition to be metallic, and so we end up with having to make our dynamo out of the higher percentage of water, ammonia, and methane, WAM, um, which are, are mixed in with hydrogen at a higher percentage in these planets. And so you have, have um, magnetic fields that are thought to be produced in the outer layers of these planets. So let's look at this, what I mean by this. Let's look at the planets the radius of the core compared with the planet. And so, you know, um, you've got a, a smaller core for Saturn, which explains why it's weaker than, than magnetic fields, weaker than Jupiter. Uh, Uranus and Neptune are quite large, but you'll see from these, uh, you can either describe the irregularity in terms of a tilt and an offset and so on, but really what you want to do is to compare that quadrupole moment to the dipole moment. So you remember in your lab, you were looking at quadrupole magnetic fields versus dipole and magnetic fields. And you'll see that for um, the more dipole and magnetic fields of Earth, Jupiter, and Saturn, that number's small, and it's really large for Uranus and Neptune. So that's just an indicator of the regularity of that. Yes? Yes just the ratio of those two coefficients, right. Indeed, here we have those coefficients, one, two, and three, so we're just looking at the quadrupole and octopole here, and power again, you'll see that for Earth, Jupiter, and Saturn, these are small, these numbers are quite large. So this tells you that you have a more complex field, and this is from a simulation by um, Sabina Stanley and Jeremy Bloxham. You'll see that if you generate uh, a dynamo in a, in a shell around the outside, then you will end up with a more complex magnetic field. Okay. Okay, so we need to talk a little bit about equation of state. What are the uh, properties that are, what are the quantities that are related in the equation of state? Pressure, density, temperature, those are the main things. And you can and, and, uh, relate other quantities from those. Okay, good. So let's think about this. In order to model the interiors of the planets, and this is an example of, of Jupiter, which will be explored by Juno next year, and trying to get a sense of the, the distribution of, uh, of, of mass and magnetic field and flows inside this giant planet, um, we have a guess of what it's like inside um, using some sense of an equation of state. Uh, as well as what we think is the composition and so on, uh, constraining it with, with bulk properties that we can measure. Um, and then we get a sense that uh, because it's cooler up here, the he helium rains out, you end up with a helium-rich layer, we think, perhaps. Uh, and then at some point, you hit the metallic hydrogen 
um, layer, and then you have a core deep down. Big questions about whether or not you, in fact, have this core material of heavy elements, um, all of the elements that are not hydrogen and helium, mixed in here, or are they actually separating out? And how do we describe the equation of state at millions of mega, these are mega bars, right, um, which we cannot measure in, in even the most um, sophisticated lab experiments at Lawrence Livermore, where they have lasers hitting hydrogen. You know, they're interested in high pressure, high temperature hydrogen at a defense lab. I wonder why they might be interested in it. Okay. But even the guys who, who make hydrogen bombs really don't know what goes on to the equation of state of hydrogen at these very high pressures. So what we'll probably do I'll come, is, is we'll make these measurements, we'll get a sense of what's going on, and then as our equation of state for hydrogen becomes more sophisticated, um, we will probably keep revising and, and understanding inside. So you need to fold together the theory of the equation of state with the practical measurements that you make outside. Oh, um, I think the current measure, measurements are around this phase transition. They have actually measured that phase transition, so it's about two megabars. But of course, um, if I knew the real number, I'd, you'd have to shoot me. Okay. Um, okay. More. This is this is uh, what will be coming in the next year in a year's time. Uh, and what's interesting, though, is that when Juno measures this power again versus harmonic degree, right? Several times we've seen this diagram. When we measure this uh, here for the Earth, we have what we had here: this power law for giving us the dynamo, and then we had the crustal magnetic field, right? Horizontally, equal power as a function of harmonic degree. But with Jupiter, because it doesn't have a crust, right? We can keep going deeper and deeper to higher harmonics. And depending on where the core mantle boundary is, we should be able to go out to about harmonic degree of, you know, maybe as far out as 20. We'll be able to describe the dynamo of Jupiter far better than the dynamo of the Earth, right? Because we'll be able to go to these high degrees, which will be really cool. We'll also be able to, with the gravity measurements, measure the density distribution and maybe the flows inside. OK, so what are the consequences of these magnetic fields? And I'm going to wrap up pretty quickly here uh, for the magnetospheres. Uh, we've talked about the size of the magnetosphere being defined by this balance of ram pressure and magnetic pressure inside. And this is the chapman ferraro standoff distance that I'm sure you've, you've seen before. And because of the, um, the magnetic field dropping off as one, a dipole dropping off as one over R squared, the power, then the, um, you end up with this minus sixth power um, of the ram pressure when you get the chapman ferraro distance. So this means you have a very, uh, uh, very rigid obstacle to the solar wind where you know, large changes in the ram pressure produce relatively small changes in the size of the magnetosphere. So if we look at our planets, we look at the surface fields. This is the dipole equatorial field. And you calculate this uh, chapman ferraro distance, you end up with magnetospheres of different sizes relative to the size of the planet. Normalizing to the size of the planet is really the useful way to do it. And then we look at the observations. You'll see that for Mercury, it's pretty good. For Earth, it's pretty good. Uranus, Neptune, and Saturn, it's pretty good. But it does a lousy job at Jupiter. And what is the reason for this? Question. Yes. Yeah. Why is it so? OK, so you have to realize we've had one flyby of Uranus. So the question was, why, why is it, it? I think you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong. Here, you've, you've, got, you've got a single value. Here, you've got a range. And here, you've got a range. OK, okay. 
Um, the, we've got one fly of Uranus, flyby of Uranus, one flyby of um, Neptune. Turns out it was a particularly high Mach flow going past um, Uranus at the time. We had the highest. Bar I, I wrote a paper, and I think I had the for a short while the highest Mach number bar shot ever found anywhere. Um, but uh, we only had one 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 um, flyby, one measurement. Uh, at Neptune, um, we had it, the, the things were fluctuating. And so we saw a couple of shock, a couple of boundaries. Um, these numbers are not to be, you know, I should have error bars. Yes, I should have error bars. <laughs> this, these things are really well defined, right? Okay. So I'm being sloppy. Okay, so for Uranus and Neptune, You've got problems because you've got this, you've got, we'll talk about that in a second. If I can get to the movie, you'll see when I show you the movie, all will be clear. Um, for, 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 for these are sort of well behaved, the, the, the variations in the size. Um, um, this is for, these are calculated for standard solar wind pressures and, and is, Substantial variations in, in reality, of, but but let's let's talk about the big one, which is this one. This is the elephant in the room, right? Why is it not agreeing to a factor of two? And the answer is, uh, and this is just a just a diagram that shows the same thing. If we scaled everything to a dipole, you would end up with um, a, a size that's a lot considerably smaller for Jupiter. And the big difference is the fact that you heavily inflate these magnetospheres of, of some extent Saturn, but certainly with Jupiter with hot plasma. So you remember in the Chapman Ferraro, we're just balancing two terms, ram pressure and magnetic pressure. You add plasma pressure inside, you're going to inflate that magnetosphere a lot more. And, and um, the, that pressure boundary will be much further out. Now it turns out we do have measure, lots of measurements of Saturn and Jupiter. And the, it turns out there's actually a bimodal distribution of that magnetopause standoff distance, which is a current area of uh, uh, research, which sort of suggests that you tend to have a compressed or a highly expanded state. And um, this could be explained by much more dipolar, uh, not by a bipolar, bipolar uh, description of the solar wind ram pressure at these distances. Um, but this is, uh, this is as, as Nick will talk more about what's going on inside, this has a lot more to do with the complexities of the magnetosphere inside rather than a simple dipole standoff of the RAM pressure. Okay, so uh, when you look at the different planets, you have these really small environments uh, at the terrestrial planets, Jupiter and Saturn, you're enclosing the moons uh, and, and uh, Neptune, Uranus and Neptune, you're enclosing the moons um, inside these magnetospheres. So let me just um, talk a little bit about these exotic ones. We have the small magnetosphere of Mercury, which changes enormously with the magnetic field of the sun. Stump storms that are just going bonkers. At the time scales are really short. Multiple stump storms, huge changes um, in response to changes in the solar wind. These things are actually the same size as, uh, this is the diameter of the Earth. So, you know, these things are really quite, whole magnetosphere would fit within the Earth. Uh, at Ganymede, we have uh, a small magnetosphere again um, that's in, in, within Jupiter's magnetic field. So my question to you is, where do these field lines go? They go to Jupiter ionosphere, right, where they produce aurora. So uh, this is a magnetosphere within a magnetosphere, and um, we, it's a very different sort of structure. You can see very large polar region that cou couples to the planet. Okay, so a completely different configuration, a little difficult to get your head around. Okay, and we can see aurora on the planet, uh, sorry, on the moon, Ganymede, not a planet, orbits the Jupiter. 
and you can see these regions that correspond more or less to the open closed boundary uh, of this magnetosphere, little magnetosphere. These are Hubble pictures of the aurora on Ganymede, Ganymede's atmosphere. Okay, so Uranus and Neptune are really bizarre. We have very little information, but what happens here, as this is the time of Voyager, you have a, 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 the spin axis is pointed towards the sun, more or less. You have a very tilted dipole, and as the um, planet spins, you get a twisted tail behind. Here's a, a little simulation that you can see, and um, you get this really messy uh, tail down, down the tail. And you can think about what happens to the Dungy cycle as you have this spinning, turning on and off reconnection okay, over a rotation rate. We go to, Saturn, to, to Neptune. We have a really interesting situation. Uh, again, this is actually the time of Voyager. You have a, a, a spin axis here tilted very much like Saturn and the Earth, uh, but then you have a magnetic field that is, is away from the spin axis. And so when you look at different configurations uh, it, within a rotation, you will see that you go from a sort of normal magnetosphere type configuration to a really weird configuration, a pole-on configuration, with a cylindrical plasma sheet in the tail, a cusp pointed towards the sun. Really bizarre, very strange. And um, these are worth thinking about. This paper by Ziegler look, used BATS RS to explore this. Uh, these are the sort of configurations you might find during a reversal when you have a higher multipole magnetic field uh, interacting with the solar wind. So um, these are exotic magnetospheres, but have some relevance to thinking about what happened to the Earth at, at, at earlier times. OK, um, I will just leave it there and uh, leave you to anticipate what we're going to see in a year's time uh, with Juno. Thank you very much.